Thank you very much. So um, I want to start by thanking the committee for, for inviting me here, and I think it's been some really, really interesting talk, so I feel very fortunate to be able to, to finish this uh, line of exciting presentations. And some of the things that I'm going to talk about, my, my talk has this title here, Risk Assessment and Regulation of Plastic Pollutions, and we have touched upon some of the elements already, both yesterday and today, so sometimes I was uh, biting my tongue not to uh, break some of the things that I have here today. So, But I think that maybe I can uh, shed some light over some of the questions that was earlier on, but uh, yeah, let's see. Um, so this is an overview of what I'm going to talk about. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, risk assessment and how risk assessment uh, serves as a scientific foundation for uh, regulation. And then I'm going to draw upon two uh, different projects in, in addressing this uh, assessment here. So first, uh, the experience from what's called the SAPIA report that I was part of uh, in the fall uh, last year. And then finally, I'm going to tell you about a project that we terminated by the end of 2018 in our uh, local area called uh, the Roskilde Fjord, where we work with plastic pollution there. Okay, so a little bit about the SAPIA report. So uh, SAPIA, for those of you who are not familiar with that, it is uh, short for Science Advice for Policy by European Academies. And it is an a EU-funded uh, project where experts are gathered in order to do scientific reports that can then inform policy making in EU. So I was part of this group that was asked to do this report on, on uh, the scientific foundation for regulation of microplastics. And what we did was that we've had, uh, we did a, it was a literature uh, review we did. We had focus on newer literature, but not solely newer literature. It went into an external review before it was published, and it was published uh, early this year here, and has been discussed uh, yeah, in several different policy uh, uh, situations. The SAM, which is the scientific advice mechanism, which is top scientists that inform uh, the European Commission directly uh, and give policy advice to them, they recently published their scientific opinion, which is based on this report here. So I have, in the end of my presentation, I have a link to the report if you have interest in reading it. Both the report and the opinion is, uh, is available online. Okay, this is just all the group of uh, experts that went into this work here. It was led by Professor Bart Coleman from uh, University of uh, Wageningen and Sabine Powell, Dr. Sabine Powell from the University of Plymouth was uh, vice chair it. And here are all the, the members of, of this group. Okay, then on to, to, to the topic itself. So, first of all, the role of science and risk assessment. So, yesterday we were already introduced a little bit to risk assessment and how it works. So, I'm not going to, to dwell up too much into that. But what we must understand, I think, is that risk assessment is sort of, you can say, I call it the institutionalized utilization of science into policy. So, we have research into effects and into exposures here, and that is sort of operating, uh, turned into to effect assessment and exposure assessment that are used for risk characterization that then uh, inform uh, policy. And the big question in, in this regard here is, can we really do this? And I think that we had a lot of the answers yesterday. It's really, really difficult to do this. But nonetheless, the question from a policy perspective is, what do we do if we can't do this? Do we don't take any action or do we take action until we have sort of the scientific evidence. So we, we addressed this. This is, this is the three main chapters of the report here. So we had a, a chapter on uh, environmental impact, one on societal aspects and one on policies and regulation. And I'm going to draw upon the conclusions from these three chapters in, the, in this presentation here. So first one here, the environment. This was where we sort of addressed how can we do risk assessment? Do we have the knowledge to actually assess whether microplastic pose a risk or not? And this is some of the conclusions here. Everybody that worked with plastic know that we find it everywhere. So this was not something that we could really disagree upon. It's been found everywhere throughout uh, the environment and in biota. Um, but one of the things that we also heard about that yesterday is that the sampling techniques that have typically been used to uh, collect plastic um, all have some limitations. For example, the mantle troll, which has been used to collect a lot of the samples, 
has this mesh size of 0.3 millimeters, so we are missing all the particles below 0.3 millimeters. There's also an inconsistency of, uh, of different sampling and how we, we, uh, we measure that, so some data will be presented in particles per square kilometers, other data will be presented in particles per cubic meter of water, so they're not always comparable, and this makes it difficult to use for regulatory purposes. So one of the conclusions is that we need to work on internationally harmonize uh, these type of tests so we can, uh, in a more uh, rigid way, use them for regulatory context. So this was the exposure part of, of, uh, of the risk assessment. Obviously, we have a lot of challenges here. Um, and into to the effect assessment, this is also a challenging thing, and we also talked about that yesterday here. This, this is from a paper published by Lenz et al. And what we see here is they reviewed uh, several papers here. These are the concentrations of particles used in these papers here. And down here we have the, the concentrations of particles found in the environment. So the majority of the effect studies that we uh, see in the literature now uh, are carried out with very high dose and very short exposure times. And what we see in the environment is very low dose and very long exposure times. So the question is, can we really extrapolate these type of effects into what we really want to try to protect for the environment? Furthermore, and we also talked about that yesterday, the type of particles that has been used are typically beads, uh, primary microplastic beads, whereas what we find in the environment are secondary microplastic weathered microplastic fibers, these kinds of things. And then finally, one of the things that we discussed and that is, there's a huge need for is to determine what are the best, best endpoints to assess effects of plastics. Because as it is now, we are trying to adopt the, the endpoints that we use for soluble chemicals, see whether they work or not. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Um, but we still have to agree upon which are the best endpoints. And one, one critical aspect is that when we do laboratory study, we will never be able to mimic environmental conditions fully. That's just impossible, so we shouldn't even uh, try to that. We can get as close as possible, but we have to, to some ex extent, extrapolate from our, uh, our laboratory settings to the environment. So the endpoints that we are measuring, we need to be sure that we can actually extrapolate these effects that we measure here. So we don't, for example, if we drown a fish in microplastic, yeah, it dies, but that will never be something that would be realistic in an environmental setting because the numbers of particles must be much lower. So we need to have endpoints where we are sure that the, the effects that we see are not artifacts of the very high concentrations. Okay, so some of the conclusions, so despite this, despite this, uh, our inability to really conduct risk assessment currently, we still uh, were tasked to see whether uh, we could get a scientific uh, opinion about whether there was a risk of microplastic or not. And these are some of the conclusions here. I'm just going to uh, read them out and then uh, talk a little bit about that. So one thing, the first thing that we could agree upon was that uh, there may at present be at least some locations where the predicted measured environmental concentrations exceed predicted no effect concentrations. So scenarios where there is a risk. And Martin talked about some of the situations yesterday where we have very hot spots with very high concentrations. So we do see areas now where there seems to be a risk already. The next conclusion is then that it is more likely than not that ecological risk of microplastics are rare. So there's no widespread occurrence of this. So we have these hotspots where we do see it, but it's not like microplastic pose a risk all over the globe currently. And then, uh, finally here, if microplastic emissions to the environment rem re re will remain the same, the ecological risk might be widespread within a century. So if you continue with a business as usual scenario, continue to uh, lose as much uh, plastic to the environment as we do now, we might actually see widespread scenarios with where microplastic pose a risk. We need to develop risk assessment methods. Um, we need to develop methodologies that can account for re environmental realistic scenarios and need to be standardized uh, for us to, to assess this risk more uh, generally. And then finally, and I think this was really important, that even though we cannot do what we can call high quality risk assessments or real reliable risk assessment currently, we shouldn't 
stop making actions to reduce or prevent or mitigate uh, effects. So this is actually uh, one of the conclusions that we need to take action even though we cannot risk, uh, assess risks uh, currently. And if we look at the historical context, also how chemical has been discussed, this is quite uh, a bold uh, conclusion, I should say, because this actually requires some kind of precautionary measures. Okay, so this was a little bit about our conclusion in regard to, um, to, to risk assessment and how science feeds into that. Then I'm turning my view over to regulation and I'm going to focus on EU. Uh, there is obviously a lot of international uh, legislations as well, but I'm going to focus on EU. Um, and one of the things that we discussed this to some extent already, this focus on, on the, linear, uh, the transition from the linear economy into the circular economy. And this is, I think, the key concept that uh, people in Brussels are working with now, and this is seen as the solution to the plastic problem. So the thing is, we have this linear uh, production uh, value chain where um, plastics are produced and then uh, shipped and used and then end up in some kind outside the value chain in, in, in the waste phase. And we need to change that into the more circular approach. And if you look at some of the strategy papers that come out of EU recently, especially these two here, the EU plastic strategy and the EU action plan for a circular economy, these, these are key elements here. And the, the action plan for circular economy is actually pretty bold in regard to what uh, actions they have here. We talked earlier about whether there was this regulatory incentive for industry to, uh, to, uh, to work with reducing especially uh, plastic waste from, from packaging material. And some of the ambitions in this uh, action plan in here is that by two, uh, 2030, all packaging, plastic packaging in EU have to feed into this circular economy here. So it has to be either reusable or recyclable, everything. And 50% of all plastic waste have to be recyclable as well. So this is within a, almost within a decade from now. So that's an enormous task. This is a figure from uh, a report made by the Eddie MacArthur Foundation that look at plastic packaging. And, and it, I think it, it illustrates the, the problem with pl plastic packaging very well. What we see here is the production of plastic and where it ends up. And I don't know if you can read these numbers here, but these are 2013 numbers, and these are EU numbers, so this is in Europe. 40% ended up in landfills, and 32% leaked into the environment. That's quite a massive number, I think. Only 14% were collected for recycling, and out of these 14%, only 2% feed into what's called a closed-loop recycling, where there's no loss of quality of the product there. So this, having to expand this arrow to a much, much broader arrow, that's really the challenge that we, we are faced with. There are many ways that, that EU work with this. One of the, the ways is by implementing legislation, obviously. And I'll just give two examples of that. So the plastic bag, which we also briefly discussed uh, yesterday, plastic bag directive, which was uh, adopted in 2015. These are... Um, the background for, for adopting that, so what you can see here is uh, use of plastic bag per person per year, and it's uh, organized into two different categories, what's called single-use plastic carrier bags and multiple-use. And you can see there's a, lot, a big difference here, but the reason why this, this uh, legislation was adopted in the first place was that there was found 22 million plastic bags found on the, on the coastlines in Europe. So plastic bags were pretty much everywhere and EU citizens used approximately 200 plastic bags per year. In average, you can see, obviously, some use more than others. <clears throat> so the aim for the directive was to reduce this consumption to 90 plastic bags per, uh, per person per year in 2019, so that's this year, and further on to 40 in 2025. And I actually haven't seen numbers of how far, how well this has been doing uh, so far, so I don't cannot tell you how close we are to this goal here. But the, the measure that is used here is putting fees on these uh, plastic bags here. So it's not banning the plastic bag, but it's putting a fee on it. So this is one the way that, that EU works with this. 
Another one, which is recently adopted, the, the single-use plastic directive, also called the SOP directive. Um, it aimed at reducing the most commonly found single-use plastic products and fishing gears. It's adopted here in 2019, so it's recently adopted. And the categories are based on monitoring data from beach litter surveys. So but this, these are all the categories here. These are the things that are going to be banned. And the reason why these are banned, this is because this is what we found, have been found in, in litter surveys across uh, beaches in Europe over the last years here. And you can see it is 50% of all uh, marine litter is these categories here. So, uh, yeah, we are going to find alternatives to using straws when we drink cocktails in the future. Hopefully we won't throw as many cigarette butts as we do now, unfortunately. Okay, so these are just two examples of how, how EU work. Then I'm going to turn over to, to the Sapir report, because what we did here was also that we, we assessed all the legislation in EU that addressed plastic pollution here. Uh, and we categorized that into four different type of categories. So one type of category is what we call product legislations, which could be REACH that we talked about yesterday, the, the chemical legislation and the sub-directive. Then there are waste legislations, such as the Waste Framework Directive, Urban Wastewater Di uh, Treatment Directive, environmental legislations, such as the Drinking Water Directive and the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. And finally, there are these non-binding strategies that I started the talking about. So these are all the different uh, legislations that we went through. And what this table shows here is which of these different legislations, to what extent they address microplastic explicitly. Because what the Commission asked us was to do a report on microplastic, not necessarily on plastic waste in general. So this exercise was to see to what extent uh, um, a microplastic address specifically. As you can see, there's not a lot of the legislations that address this uh, microplastic very specifically. They can still address plastic pollution in a more general term, but not microplastic. So what we did with the analysis was one thing was to see there are these governing principles of how EU legislation should be made. The precautionary principle, principle of proportionality, and the polluter pay principle. And these three principles, we went through all the legislations to see to what extent they were implemented as a foundation for the legislation. And then we also evaluated to what extent these legislations were based on the scientific state of the art. Um, and some of the conclusions here uh, from this chapter here was that what we see is that there's actually a limited scientific understanding, but there are still measures being taken. So this can be seen as a way of actually a precautionary measures, that action is being taken even though we cannot uh, prove whether microplastic pose a risk or not. Then there is the extended producer responsibility. Um, so this is you know, where producers have responsibility for their product throughout the entire life cycle. And one of the things that is being discussed is how this can be implemented. And for example, in regard to fishing gear in the new sub directive, it has been discussed how you can get incentive to producers of, of fishing nets. If they produce fishing nets in a way where it's easily recyclable, they will get a, a discount in, in, in different kind of fees. So this is one of the ways that extended producer responsibility is being implemented now. And it can be viewed as an implementation of this principle here. One of the things that is often discussed in regard to legislations is whether it promotes progress in society or whether it sort of blocks innovation. Um, and what we also agreed was that measures has to be put into legally binding text, and if we do that, they can create new market for innovative solutions. And one of the uh, one of the conclusions, one of the perspectives that the EU have in their uh, in the in the circular economy strategy is that uh, this recycle market should generate more than 200,000 new jobs before uh, 2025. So there is a lot of jobs in this in the future here. And then we agreed that there are sort of two focal, focal points that you should have. One would be focus on emission reduction, so we need to lose less plastic to the environment. And the other one is that we also need to work on how to produce less hazardous materials. So there are type of uh, uses where we will inevitably 
lose plastic to the environment. Fishing gear, plastic fibers will wear off when we use fishing gear. Uh, so we need to produce less hazardous materials for that. And then finally, also that at present the majority of legislations are not based on the scientific state of the art. So it really needs to be reviewed to be based on the scientific state of the art, which has exploded over the last decade or so. Okay. Then my last part concerns uh, citizen science, local involvement, and societal actions here. Uh, and it draws upon uh, this chapter here, which has to do with society, and then finally also the, the local project that we did uh, in, in our local community here. So one of the things that is important to recognize is that this is a figure that shows how plastics flow from the economy into society and end up in the environment. And all these steps here, the plastic flow from each of these steps here are based on decisions and behavior. So each step here, whenever we lose something, it is something that we do. It's something that we can do something about. We can, we can stop this. So influence and decision and behavior of people is the key to not losing uh, as much plastic to the environment. But one of the issues is that many external costs are not met by the producer and the consumer. So the cost of this uh, whale here, or whatever it is, uh, uh, the plastic ends up in the stomach of this whale, it is not reflected in the production cost or the use cost here. So there is a, a, a lack of incentive, an economic incentive to actually stop losing uh, plastic, uh, uh, plastic to the environment. And then, also very important, that large pieces of uh, plastic debris will become microplastic. And we talked a little bit about that yesterday, so if we stop the larger pieces of plastic from into the environment. We also solve by the far majority of the microplastic problem because the majority of the microplastic stems from larger pieces of, of, of plastic. So, so it is key to stop these larger pieces of plastic from entering the environment. Another thing we did was that we went over uh, all the different papers that have come out that has uh, relate to, to, to uh, microplastics in the last couple of years. And what we can see here is the numbers of studies within different uh, areas. And what we can see, there's a lot of studies that concerns natural science and technical science, and very few studies that concerns sort of uh, political science, social science, and humanities. And as we just learned, these areas are where the real change is happening. So we need, there's a really big need for actual research into these areas here. Um, and then also there's a need for people working in this area to work together with people in this area here. And we don't see that a lot. So this is something that we as a, a group sort of encourage our colleagues around the world to work more with. Media has a huge influence on how the perception of plastic is. This is an overview over all the media uh, mentions of plastic over two years. Uh, but we can see that there is some highlights. So there's a highlight here. When there was a study, microplastic fountain in bottled drinking water. Woof, that gave a lot of uh, media attention. Then it dropped a little bit. Then there was World uh, Environmental Day and a report released by uh, the WWF. That also gave a lot of attention. And then finally, we saw a lot of attention here when this study where they found microplastic in human feces was, was, uh, was released into uh, the media here. So what this illustrates is that there's a lot of focus from the media, especially when the uh, exposure of microplastic can be linked to human exposure to some extent. Then media are really interested in that. And the media has a huge influence on the public awareness, the public... Uh, what we could call the, the public discourse regarding micro and dinoplastics here. So even though scientists like to do science, we like to do that, us talking with the media and informing the media so they don't give wrong uh, information is really, really key, not just to informing the public, but also to informing policymakers. Yeah, so a few conclusions from this chapter here. One of the things that which might be pretty obvious, but still nice to, to, to just remind our, uh, each other is that 
Our decisions is behavior is the sole call of plastic pollution. So with other type of contaminants, metals, uh, oils, there is sort of a background pollution, not with plastic. If we find plastic in the environment, it's our fault. And, but, and that also spins into this uh, conclusion here, that there appears to be a consensus between different societal actors. So to date, there is little indication of plastic pollution deniers. So we don't find anyone, we haven't seen anyone that says, no, no, plastic pollution is not a problem at all. And there's a great feeling of co-responsibility by the public and willingness to, to, to make changes here. So we see a huge engagement from, from uh, uh, all over the public. It's something that we really need to build upon. And I think, and this is my personal opinion, that there's a huge potential also to spill over into other environmental areas uh, from this uh, willingness to, to sort of protect the environment from plastic pollution. But... One very important role that we have as scientists is that there should be these rigorous evaluations of measures and interventions to understand unintended consequences, side effects, trade-offs with other important outcomes. So, for example, there are some that would argue that we need plastic-free society. A plastic-free society, from a scientific point of view, is not a very good idea because there are many uses of plastic where plastic is the most uh, environmental friendly uh, aspect. So we need to also work on, on telling what is the uh, type of plastic uh, production that we need to reduce and which are actually the best use that we have the most environmental friendly use. Okay. So the final few slides is on a project that we had in our uh, local content. And the reason why I want to show this also is because now I've talked a little bit about the importance of uh, engaging uh, citizens also both in uh, awareness building but also in policy making. And what we did here, um, this is Roskilde Fjord, uh, what we did here was we, we worked over three years uh, in this area here and we work with what's called the DEPSIA model, maybe some of you know that, it's developed by the European Environmental Agency. It's sort of a holistic way to address any kind of environmental contamination in an area. So we work with it with plastics. So it's basically it identifies drivers for the pollution, so consumption of plastic, industrial use of plastic. What are the pressures? How do the plastic enter the environment? Is it waste on beaches? Is it from wastewater treatment plants, point sources? What is the state? How much do we find in the environment, both in biota and uh, in the water, in the sediment? And what is the impact, both impact on the ecosystems, but also impact on what we call ecosystem services, so fisheries, tourism. There's a lot of uh, tourism re related to uh, the, uh, the Viking Ship Museum, which is in Roskilde. So, and then finally, when you sort of have uh, addressed all these different areas, then the final thing is that you can work with what type of response, how can we address this type of uh, contamination in this area here. So there can be cleaner technologies, can we make our waste water treatment plant better, can we work with policy measures, can we educate our children, and can we work with citizen-driven initiatives. And we work with all these different aspects here, and one of the things we work with was citizen science. Um, and, and you can say that there's two different forms of citizen science. A typically classical way is what we call top-down citizen science, where we as experts define the aim. We ask citizens, please go out and help us collect plastic on the beaches, for example. Then they deliver the data for us, we analyze the data, and we can come up with solutions. This has had great success in many places. The, the challenge with this is that it is very much driven by the experts. So there is a risk that once the experts leave, the citizens might not keep continuing doing this action here. So that's why we work with this, but we also work with that additional approach called uh, bottom-up citizen science, where instead of it, that the expert just define the, uh, the, uh, the aim, it's done in collaboration with the citizens. So their daily life is taken into consideration what do they think is the problem, and how do they want to address that? That leads into action then, that then can lead down 
back into solutions that is made in collaboration with scientists and also the citizen work that, that works in the area and lives in the area. So we worked with this, we did workshop with local citizens that were uh, engaged. We heard about what they think uh, would the problem be and what ideas they had. They had many ideas, some more crazy than others. Some of them turned into something good, some didn't turn into anything. Uh, so we had this part and then we also worked with technical aspects. We worked with a local wastewater treatment plant. Uh, develop, uh, we had this company that had this membrane filtration that we put on, on the effluent water to collect microplastic there to see how important the wastewater was as a, as a point source. So this holistic way of working with that. I think it turned out to some, some pretty good results, if I should say it myself. So one of the things was, for example, we were able to identify a, a small private wastewater treatment plant that had a lot of uh, point exposure. And because we were also working with the local community, we were able to, uh, to identify this man, and he was not aware that he was actually doing this pollution. So he stopped this pollution. So it was a very specific way, part of pollution was stopped. And then another nice thing was that and on one of the meetings where we involved uh, a lot of local politicians, and this was just before a local election, so they were very engaged. Uh, and they were then uh, hearing about all the different initiatives and all the concern by the citizens in the area. And it ended up with the mayor of one of the communities around Roskirchur. He stood up and says, we are going to do something about this. And then the, another mayor from another uh, municipality raised up and said, we are going to do this about something about this as well. So they actually formed this political network across parties from the left to the right, actually and across different municipalities. And I don't think that this kind of network would ever have been established unless they had seen the engagement of their local citizens there. It also spun a lot of other interests just outside of our uh, local system here. So we had the Greenland Parliament sent this uh, delegation here to, to talk with us and learn how we work with local citizens because they obviously also have a lot of, of pollution in Greenland. We were invited into the Danish Parliament to tell about the progress there. And someone also was stupid enough to give us a prize for this work, actually. Yeah, so... <clears throat> In conclusion, uh, I would say that there's a lot of activities going on with this plastic area here. Regulation is uh, being implemented very, very rapidly. It's also being implemented so rapidly that it doesn't always take science into consideration. And this is something that we need to be aware of as scientists working with all different fields here. But there's a lot of engagement on all different societal levels to do something about that, on the policy level, but also on individual level here. So there's a lot of things to work with, and that's actually quite uh, nice so compared to many other environmental areas where, where initiatives are not as strong as it is here. Yeah, this is just a thank you for the Sapir team who that helped us with the report and the partners in the Roskilde Fjord project. And also, thank you for your attention.